Good morning, my name is Vicki Marks and uh, thank you for being here. Today's webinar session is scheduled for 60 minutes. It's being recorded. Uh, to minimize potential distractions and interruptions, all webinar participants have been muted. We will make sure to have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, and uh, to uh, ask a question, just submit, uh, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this will open a, a question and answer window in the webinar interface. Type your question and click send, and we will address questions at the end of the session. Um, uh, our speakers today are ready and waiting. We have Felicia Davis, who is the executive director of the Radiology Residency Review Committee. We have Janet Bailey, who is the chair of the Radiology Residency Review Committee. And we hope to have Laura Edgers, who is the ACGME Vice President for Milestone Development. Um, I want to thank you in advance for your presentation, and I want to thank the AUR and APDR staff uh, for organizing this virtual meeting. Um, thank you very much, and let's get started. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marks. Um, again, thank you to the APDR staff and the planning group um, that put this webinar together. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to present um, to the radiology group any chance I get because I love you. Um, today, Dr. Bailey and I will discuss ACGME COVID actions. Um, we will then look at COVID actions as related to radiology and the radiology IRC. Um, and then we will look at revisions, upcoming revisions, to both the IR and DR program requirements. So let's talk about the ACGME COVID actions um, thus far. I'm going to take sort of the 30,000 foot view um, of what has happened uh, thus far. Um, ACGME has made several deliberate efforts to maintain the lines of communication with the entire GME community. Um, the first of those modalities is our weekly e-communication. Um, the first announcement with any statements related to COVID appeared in the February 17th um, issue of the e-communication. And in mid-March, we decided to commandeer the e-communication by suspending its normal content of providing updates to relative different specialties and um, events going on at ACGME. And it is now entirely devoted to updates uh, related to COVID coming from the ACGME leadership. Um, probably one of the most important um, items that came out in terms of accreditation was the March 18th letter from our CEO, Dr. Thomas Nasta, which is a letter to the GME community which announced the susp suspension of several accreditation activities, including the self-study activities, all the site visits, and both the resident and faculty surveys. So the resident and faculty surveys, that announcement stated that the surveys this year are optional for all programs, okay? Um, the surveys are typically administered in a sequence of three windows that begin in January through April of every calendar year. Uh, the first window was from January to February. The second window began in February and ended in March 15th. And the third window began March 9th and ended in June uh, and will and has been extended to end June 26th, um, but it was originally scheduled to end in April. Um, while the participation is optional, please don't take this extension as um, an assertion that it is required to complete the survey. We just wanted to provide an opportunity for those programs that have the ability um, and maybe the uh, demands in your clinical environments have shifted in such a way that you have the ability to continue to oversee the administration of the survey. We certainly wanted to give an opportunity and time for that interaction to play out. This year with the residents or in the uh, resident and faculty surveys, we um, used a, um, we used the same completion rate for both the resident and faculty surveys. So prior to this year's administration, the expectation was that programs reach 70% completion rate for the resident survey and 60% completion rate for the faculty survey. Starting with the new um, ACGME common program requirements that were implemented in July 1, 2019. Both of these surveys were completely redone to align with the new common program requirements. And in so doing, we decided to make the completion rate the same for both the resident and faculty surveys. But this year, because of the implications of COVID, any program that has achieved less than a 70% completion rate on the resident or faculty survey will not be cited. Okay, please note that. Um, I looked at the data 
um, as it relates to radiology. And the reports that I pulled showed that there's approximately 80 diagnostic radiology programs have been affected. And what I mean is um, each survey window has a certain set of specialties that are assigned to that survey window. Radiology, unfortunately, was assigned to window three, which is typically our protocol. Um, and the survey window began just as the height of the COVID um, uh, activities were heating up and the national quarantine began. So that was probably the window that was most affected. So that means there are probably, there are roughly 80 programs that have not achieved 70% completion on the resident and or faculty surveys as of right now. Um, we received some inquiries in the office. Um, people were confused by some of the um, alerts that they're seeing in the accreditation data system. Now, just because we made the administrative decision that completion of the surveys are optional, the programming of our data system has not changed. So the system is still functioning as if there, was, if there's, if there were no changes to the clinical environment and that no exceptions had been made. So if you log into the ADS system and you go to the overview tab here at the top, you will still see on this page these red alerts that notify you that you're missing information or that you have not achieved 70% completion on the resident and faculty survey. Please don't be deterred by these alerts. They're going to show um, our overriding principle and the overriding guiding principle that we issued that the participation is optional will override anything that you see in the system and it will not have a negative impact on your program. Um, the site visits, all site visits, accreditation site visits and clear site visits were suspended as of March 9th. Um, many of, we had uh, several programs that were scheduled for actual site visits in the month of March and in the month of April. Um, at the time that we suspended those activities, those site visits were then postponed. If you represent a program that had a scheduled site visit during that period of time, you should have received a letter from our Department of Field Activities announcing the postponement and alerting you that once we are able to reconvene a site visit process, you will be notified of your new site visit date at that time. Interestingly enough, we're still receiving new applications during this period of time, um, not just in radiology, but across all of our GME specialties. Just please note that our ACGME policies require that any new application for a residency program must be accompanied by a site visit in order for the review committee to evaluate the information for approval. That means that in this hiatus of the site visit process, all of the reviews for those applications will be delayed. By how much? I have absolutely no idea. Right now, our Department of Field Activities is, uh, they've worked fervently on developing a virtual site visit process. That process, I'm being told, is in the beta testing phase. At this time, we've not been given any ETA as to when that process will be completed and rolled out full scale and able to bring that process back online. But please remember that once we do get a process online, we have a whole backlog of programs that we need to play catch up on. So we'll still have a bit of a delay once we're able to get back to that activity. So um, your patience during this process is certainly appreciated. DIO webinars. Um, the Institutional Review Committee, uh, right now, they host weekly webinars for all the DIOs in the country. This interaction has been very well received. Um, they tell us that they have participation from over 300 DIOs each week. Uh, these webinars are for one hour. Um, and really, the purpose of them is to just sort of provide a sharing forum for the DIOs to share uh, amongst themselves, peer-to-peer -peer interaction, um, work on problems, um, that each of them may be experiencing in their institution and sort of work together to come to resolutions to those problems. They actually even use the breakout room feature in the Zoom application um, and have some small group work uh, and then they report back to the larger group. Um, and I've talked to some DIOs and they said it has really been a valuable tool during this stressful time. It's also meant to be a community of well-being for them and an opportunity to listen and respond. Um, and not just the DIOs listening and responding to each other, but an opportunity for ACGME to listen to their concerns and struggles and allows us an opportunity to support them um, and with, uh, with whatever they need. Okay, the three stages of GME during the COVID pandemic. Um, in response to the demanding patient care pressures experienced by many of the institutions, um, we published in our March 24th communication, we announced a new framework for sponsoring institutions to function in one of three stages. 
Stage one is business as usual, meaning that you have no significant impact um, at your institution. You may be getting some plans together um, in case uh, patient care duties necessitate that you'll need to step up um, clinical support, but everything right now is business as usual. So there's no significant change to patient care or educational activities and everything is status quo. In that case, all program requirements are still applicable to those programs. Stage two, things are starting to increase, but they're still manageable. Um, maybe you're experiencing some patient care duties need to be shifted. Um, maybe there are some educational activities had to be altered or temporarily suspended, but things are still manageable. Um, in this stage, all program requirements are applicable. Stage three, emergency status. This means that your institution is in a crisis state. Your DIO has the ability to declare pandemic emergency status, which means that the adherence to the specialty specific requirements and the ACGME common requirements are suspended for that institution and all of its sponsored programs um, for a period of 30 days. This declaration um, is renewable for another 30 days after review and evaluation. Um, and even though institutions um, are exempt from demonstrating adherence to the requirements, we still expect um, adherence to the following expectations. And that is that all residents should be provided with the necessary resources and training to function during this period of time. That means that they need to have adequate PPE to interact with patients who have tested positive. They need adequate training in terms of infectious disease controls and protocols. Um, residents need adequate supervision. Even though patient care demands may be so exceedingly high, you still don't want to put residents or fellows in a situation that exceeds their level of competence. So they still need adequate supervision depending on the level of competence um, that they have demonstrated at this time. And of course, the duty hour requirements. ACGME has stringently stood firm that the duty hour requirements must remain intact even during this difficult period of time. Um, we have received the results of several specialty studies over several years. Each of those studies have come to the same conclusion, and that is that violating the duty hours by exceeding them has a direct link to adverse events, whether it's in the clinical environment or an increase in car accidents. And so for those reasons, we absolutely can't allow the duty hours to be um, exceeded during this period of time. Okay, stage three pandemic emergency status. Um, some of these statistics uh, I received on Friday um, and know that these numbers are fluid daily. Um, so they're already just a little bit out of date. Um, the statistics to the far left are the number of institutions sponsoring institutions in the country that have declared stage three status uh, that represents 148 institutions, which is roughly 17% of the accredited sponsoring institutions in the country. Within those 148 institutions, that represents just over 33 accredited programs, which also represents just over 44,000 um, residents and fellows, which represents 30% of the total population of GME trainees. Now, of that 148 um, institutions that were approved for stage three, at this point, 90% of those sponsoring institutions have renewed for an additional 30-day period. So they're now into the, to a 60-day window. But interestingly enough, um, there's roughly 15 of those um, 148 sponsoring institutions have actually transitioned from stage three back to stage two. So things have improved um, and they no longer need the provision of stage three uh, and they're managing um, status quo. This map um, gives you an idea of the percentage of sponsoring institutions by state that have declared stage three pandemic emergency status. The darkest shade of green shows the highest percentage of sponsoring institutions for that state. Um, not surprisingly, our partners in the Upper East Coast, most particularly New York, has the highest concentration of sponsoring institutions with this status at 62%. Then moving to our partners in Michigan, um, Philadelphia, Wisconsin, Illinois, Louisiana, and then as the shading gets lighter, that represents um, fewer and fewer sponsoring institutions. So I don't think that any of this is a surprise to us, especially when you realize the national statistics in terms of the volume of COVID patients experienced um, by region. ACGME accreditation and COVID. Right now, there is an ad hoc team that has been put together at ACGME to evaluate our accreditation review process for the upcoming 
um, academic year in 2020-2021. Right now, because of the impacts of COVID and the information that you will enter in your ADS update this fall, many of the input variables that we would use in our accreditation model will either be altered or missing. Um, and we just don't know at this point how we're going to account for those variances. But what I do know is whatever we come up with, there will be much grace given, not only at the ACGME level, but at the RRC level um, for all of our partners during this period of time. So please don't be deterred by revealing to us, uh, whether it be in the ADS system or declaring the stage three status, changes that have occurred in your program or at your institution related to COVID. We certainly want to understand um, the experiences um, that you've gone through um, to help us better frame a, a plan in case something like this were to ever happen again. So this year, during your ADS annual update later this summer, you can anticipate a whole new section of questions related to COVID, the COVID pandemic, and how it affected conditions in your program. With respect to clinical um, resources, with respect to the educational curriculum, um, with respect to residents and faculty, um, needing to be quarantined because they were exposed to COVID. Um, it will be a new section. It won't be very laborious. There are all radio button responses. Uh, I think there's less than, there's less than 20 questions. Um, and again, if you have to make some adjustments in your program um, and you are not stage three, you're certainly welcome to notify us of what those changes were by using the major changes section in the accreditation data system. And here I just show you a quick screenshot of where you can find the link in the ADS system to report that information. Um, ACGME has dedicated an entire section of our website to all of our guidelines and posting related to COVID um, on from the homepage. When you see that cute little picture for caring for patients, just click on the learn more button over there to the left and it will take you to this page, which has the links to all of our guidance statements, our FAQs, uh, the uh, designation of the stage three status and the form needed to do that, well-being resources and a ton of other helpful information during this period of time. And so if you've not had an opportunity to look at our website and see some of this information, I certainly encourage you to take a moment uh, and review some of that information um, very soon. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Bailey, who is going to talk to us about the radiology COVID actions. Thank you, Felicia. First of all, I know some of you are probably watching in the hospital. I just wanted to say, you know, I have empathy for you. I was in a mask all day for the last few days, and I know how hard that is. And they're not very comfortable. Uh, for those of you that are at home and might be homeschooling, um, <laughs> I will just share with you, I feel like I wipe the counters about 400 times per day, and I'm working on my fractions. Um, so hopefully everybody is surviving all of this. Um, this is our committee. This is just what we look like. Uh, and this is where we're from. So uh, you can see we're from all over the different specialties of radiology, um, but this shows where we are from geographically. And this is a map that is in red for all the states where we're from. I'm from Michigan. And this is a COVID map uh, just for numbers of cases. The CDC publishes that this was from May 7th. So the darker colors are the uh, more hit cases, more numbers of cases, not per capita, but just raw numbers. Um, and then this just shows the geography of where we're from on the committee compared to where COVID is more prevalent or less prevalent. So I think it's, um, it turned out to be pretty interesting because I think we are all from all different kinds of states, some that have barely seen any cases to some that have been hit incredibly hard. Um, so what are the COVID actions that we took from the RRC standpoint? So uh, Felicia went over the stuff that affects everybody. And this is the stuff that's really specific to radiology. So we were looking at what's happening in the world right now with COVID. The first thing, the first impact everybody saw was a huge reduction of clinical volume. The second thing, residents were sent home a lot of times to work remotely for their safety. And then the third possibility we, rec we recognized was that residents might be deployed to non-radiology assignments. So we knew that people might be sent to do internal medicine inpatient work or ICU work, especially residents that are PGY2s or the ones in the IR programs that might have even worked in your ICU before. 
So these are the sort of areas that we try to hit and looking at uh, how to handle this stuff um, and also stuff that was hit by the um, ACGME itself. And the first one I wanna go over is extension of training. So this is not something we on the RRC addressed too much, but it's just something to be aware of. The ACGME recognizes that with reduction of volume and training, there could be insufficient training for a resident and they may not have enough training in order to graduate as determined by the program director. And also they'll be assisted by the clinical competency committee if something like that happens. This is not an area that the ACGME particularly deals with because our job is to look at programs. So this is a, an actual resident issue that the program director may have to deal with. So we, we understand that. The ABR, the American Board of Radiology, who certifies the actual individual radiologists who graduate from residency programs also deals with individuals. So if you have concerns in that area, that's a little bit outside of the ACGME purview to some degree. The second thing is the case logs. So I think a lot of times we wonder why do we even do them? And the purpose of them is to have minimums so that we on the RRC can see at each program that the number of cases residents are doing and the types of cases are sufficient for the number of residents that are in the program. So the case minimums are pretty low, we think, and the, num the numbers won't be changed for the pandemic. However, the RRC will take into consideration the impact of COVID on the case logs of those graduates who are affected. So I don't think that we're gonna be strict is basically the message here. And if a program has had a big impact from the pandemic, they should put that in the major changes section of the annual program update as Felicia mentioned earlier. Um, so now getting into some specifics for radiology, the first things we had to really look at were uh, types of requirements that are beyond us. So for example, breast imaging has federal regulations through MQSA that the FDA looks at. One of those is 12 weeks of clinical rotations. So if you have a senior resident who is supposed to do some of those rotations and they can't get into the hospital during the pandemic, the RRC stipulated that telemedicine rotations would be acceptable. The next issue from the FDA is 60 hours of didactic education, and we stipulated that virtual conferences would be fine. And then the final thing is the supervised interpretation of at least 240 mammograms. Um, and so senior residents, if they're needing some more numbers to graduate, we're allowing them to look at already finalized mammograms in blinded fashion that would be supervised by an attending. So that's in case your volume has just fallen off the cliff as it has in many places and you had a resident scheduled at that time who's trying to graduate. Nuclear medicine is the other big one that has a lot of federal oversight, as everyone knows. Um, so it requires 700 hours of training and supervised work experience. So similar to mammography, the RRC was fine with telemedicine rotations as long as the AU and the department uh, authorized that. The 80 hours of classroom and lab training, the lab component has to be in person. That has always been a requirement and we don't expect the NRC to waive that. Um, and then the other thing is the oral iodine therapy. So as you know, three low dose and three high dose, those have to be done in person. We will allow two residents to share a single case as long as they fully participate. And because of the pandemic, if you have a graduating resident, a senior who cannot get their cases done before graduation because of the loss of clinical volume, the, uh, AC, the RRC will allow postgraduate documentation, meaning in their fellowship or in their attending year going out into practice, they can document those few cases they need. The ABR has told us that they would be okay with that, but it hasn't been officially sanctioned. Um, their leadership has, it, has acknowledged it would be fine. Um, ESIR is another area. This is not an area that has a lot of federal rules, but it has a lot of um, curriculum rules. So programs might look at their ESIR uh, residents and say, how am I gonna get my people through all their IR and IR related rotations? Um, the RRC is fine if you need to alter your block schedule in order to accomplish that. It just makes sense. Um, the 500 case requirement is still a requirement, but we know that with this low volume, some residents may not be able to make it. And so we expect that some will enter their independent IR residencies without the 500 cases that we had stipulated. So that's fine, but they're going to have to make it up later in the IR independent residency where they still will be required to log at least a thousand cases by the end of training. Um, there's also the ICU requirement for ESIR and institutions that are in the pandemic emergency status stage two or three um, may have schedule alterations outside of the department's control. So if an ESIR resident is not able to complete their ICU rotation, they will have to do it later during the uh, independent residency. 
Uh, the DR program director will have to note that on the verification of ESIR training, that the ICU rotation wasn't able to be done, and then that rotation will have to be done in the IR residency. The other thing is some residents might get deployed to the ICU. So if you have an ESIR resident who is redeployed out of radiology into the ICU, that would qualify as satisfying the ICU requirement. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is stuff that's going on, regular stuff, non-COVID things, going on with the DR and the IR requirement revisions that we've been working on. So these are the topics. I'm going to start with supervision. Um, basically, it's been simplified a little bit. We've always had these categories, or the most recently, we've had direct, indirect, and oversight as our three categories, but they have been simpli uh, simpli simplified, which I think is uh, going to make it a little bit easier. And the reason for this, and this happened before COVID, the reason for this is telemedicine. We've been doing teleradiology for decades, but telemedicine is ramping up more and more in the, the world of medicine. So direct supervision has been redefined to include supervision of residents via telecommunication technology as long as it's in real time. And the DR and IR resident activities that still require the physical presence, presence of a supervising physician, those will be defined directly by each program. And thirdly on this slide, just take note that the CMS has rules, hospital policies are in place, all these things are still in play as we determine what kinds of things our residents need to be directly supervised in. So here's what the actual language looks like. The supervising physician is physically present with the resident or the supervising physician is not physically present but is concurrently monitoring patient care through telecommunication. So that's what the actual language looks like for direct supervision. Indirect supervision, if you remember, had all these little caveats after it like, it's indirect, but it could be, there has to be a direct person nearby and blah, 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 blah. Well, now it's much simpler. It just says, the supervising physician is not physically present or concurrently visually present, but they are immediately available to provide direct supervision. And when this, this direct supervision now could be via Skype or over the phone or something like that. So that now qualifies as the immediately available direct supervision for those that are being indirectly supervised. I think it's easier. Um, so each program, though, has to clarify in its uh, rules and its supervision policy what its guidelines are, and it has to make sure that everybody knows what they are. So the program has to have clear guidelines that delineate which competencies have to be demonstrated to determine when a resident can progress to indirect supervision. So maybe they have to do certain rotations, maybe they have to pass an exam, something like that. You have to stipulate that in your program. And the program director has to ensure that clear expectations exist and are committed, communicated to the residents those specific times when the, there really has to be direct physical presence of a supervising attending. So for example, a lot of interventional procedures would be in that category. So that's supervision. Hopefully that's fairly clear. If it's confusing, we can go over it in the question and answer period. The board pass rate is not entirely new, but I just wanted to remind people because it was new last year. Um, this is now looked at as an aggregate three years where the bottom fifth percentile is the one group of people or programs, I should say, that's out of compliance. So the DR and IR programs are assessed completely separately and any program with a pass rate of above 80% is automatically compliant. This is what that chart looks like or how it has looked. So it's the core exam. This is the number of programs that were in this sample. 15 programs in this particular sample fell out of compliance. So you can see uh, several programs were right at the cusp um, and then others were more. So it ends up being 15 because there were several programs right at the 66.7% pass rate as a program. Um, so this is an area that is an automatic citation that we in radiology really don't have any control over at the RRC level. It's an ACGME common program requirement. Um, the next thing that we updated this year that we've put in the revisions is didactic activity. So Highlighted here in the, the first bullet point in the highlighted thing is the old rule. And it said, we must provide at least five hours, each program must provide at least five hours per week of lectures and conferences. However, meanwhile, elsewhere in the common program requirements, structured didactic activities were more inclusive than that. They included courses, labs, simulations, drills, discussions, brain rounds, didactic teaching, and either, uh, and there were other things too. This is all in the common program requirements. And, you know, really even before COVID, we had residents that 
we're wanting to do other kinds of more interactive didactic activities and not just sitting in lectures and conferences. So we altered the rule, as you see at the bottom bullet point, that says the program must provide at least five hours per week of didactic activities. So it's not as restrictive as it used to be. It's more inclusive of um, different kinds of teaching activities. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is probably the biggest change. Um, I will say up front, although it's a very big change, it's not required. So this is going to be an optional change for programs that wish to do it. So the current requirement says that to be eligible for appointment to the program, residents must have successfully completed a prerequisite year of direct patient care. So this is the prerequisite clinical year. So the proposed revision is that programs may take ownership of the clinical year. Programs might choose to develop their own clinical year, but no program will be required to do so. Programs that choose to develop a clinical year can also have all the residents in that clinical year or only some of them. It won't be required that they all do it. And this would be available for both DR and IR residency programs. So what's the rationale for even considering something like this? Well, there are several advantages that I wanted to highlight on this slide. A single residency match with a guaranteed PGY1 position is an advantage to our trainees if they're, if they're interested in it. Um, it allows programs to devise a curriculum that's more foundational for radiology. So although most of the rotations will be just like any other internship, you could have some special rotations in there that you think are important for radiology. The residents that will be learning in a clinical year associated with your program will be in your training institution so they'll learn systems that are common to both their internship and residency, making things just more efficient. So they can focus more on learning and less on learning uh, my, the EPIC or whatever information systems are in the hospital. Residents also develop close relationships during their internships with clinical attendings and also with the other clinical residents at the training institution. And to me, that's an advantage because of the professionalism uh, that's involved with knowing people that you work with and just smoothing out the entire residency between radiology and the clinical environment. Uh, residents in the clinical year also work with medical students very closely, and that's an opportunity for us in radiology to directly inspire radiology interest among those students. And finally, this is not really the rationale, but it does give you an idea of what's going on in the rest of medicine. The surgical specialties and anesthesiology residencies have already taken over ownership of their clinical years, so there are other programs that see this as a big advantage. So let's talk about the curriculum. The residents in the clinical year are to gain clinical experience and attain the clinical skills and judgment that are considered foundational to all physicians. The preliminary clinical year, while it is overseen by the radiology residency program director in this model, is not intended to be another year of radiology training. It's intended to be a rigorous and continuous curriculum during the initial 12 months of GME training with robust learning opportunities in the inpatient care realm, including critical care, and in emergency medicine. Additional clinical rotations, which might be inpatient or outpatient, can be tailored by the program, meaning the radiology program, and also could be tailored somewhat by the resident to allow for clinical experiences important to future practicing radiologists. So the details of the requirements for this clinical year, if a program chooses to do it, it has to be at least nine months of clinical rotations. Six of those months will have to be inpatient with one of them including critical care. One month has to be in the emergency department. And then at least two additional months of outpatient or inpatient clinical care, so this is not radiology, but clinical care would have to be included. If programs want to do electives in radiology, they can, but it can't be for, for more than two months, similar to our previous rule. We think that standardization of the clinical year curriculum could improve clinical training and better prepare the residents for their not only their radiology residency, but their future career. The program director we recognize will have additional burden if they choose to do this. So they will have an additional 0.2 FTE effort that can be for either the program director or the associate pro program director or a mix. And we recognize that the program director as a radiologist, while they are going to be providing oversight for this clinical year, we know that the program directors don't have specific clinical expertise. So they're administering the clinical year, but we're counting on our clinical colleagues for their expertise. So the resources involved for adding a clinical year are significant. First of all, there has to be sufficient clinical volume and variety of cases to allow an additional training year. 
We will definitely need the cooperation of clinical departments and programs that want to do this. Those of you that have developed interventional radiology residencies in the integrated model may have already experienced some of this, creating uh, cooperative relationships with our clinical colleagues. Um, there are a couple of different ways that a hospital or a health system would be able to do this in terms of budget. So if it's a budget neutral process, meaning maybe your hospital has a certain number of transitional year residency positions they would be willing to convert to radiology, that would be budget neutral. And then the other issues of clinical volume and stuff wouldn't really be an issue because the volume would clearly already be there. Um, but some residencies will be in a situation where they want to add positions and they want to ask their hospital to add positions. So for budget reasons, that can be difficult in some health systems. Um, to me, a lot of this, when you're developing a program like this, is analogous to managing the integrated IR uh, positions. So a lot of places that went from uh, VIR fellowships and DR residency, when they developed the integrated IR position, they just moved some of those fellowship positions into the integrated IR fellowship or residency. So they ended up in a budget neutral scenario. Um, and others added positions, so they en ended up in the inter incremental position scenario. So it could go either way. Um, so that's the clinical year, and I think that's a pretty big change, but it's optional. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, and I think this is the last main topic here uh, before we can get to question and answer, is the case logs. So there is work underway at ACGME to develop a useful case log for interventional radiology procedures. So as you know, right now we have an aggregate logging of DR cases so that most programs probably utilize the expertise of their program coordinators to add, to use the radiology information system, et cetera, get the cases that are required to be logged and then uh, log them in an aggregate. That doesn't work as well for interventional procedures which, for which more data is needed. So what we're trying to develop is an IR case log that will have functionality similar to the ACGME case logs in place for surgical specialties. And if this project is successful, DR will also benefit because DR residents will be able to log their IR cases as well. And one of the advantages of the system that surgery is using or the surgical specialties are using is that there's a phone app for residents to log their cases. And from what I understand, the programs at AC, programmers at ACGME say the phone app is very popular. None of this will replace the aggregate logging of DR cases. Those will still be possible. And we know that's really important in radiology, given the numbers. Um, and that is all of my content. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Janet. Is um, Laura Edgers here? I am. Yay! <laughs> Uh, my name is Laura Edgar. I am the Vice President for Milestones Development at ACGME. Um, and uh, I think this is a fabulous opportunity for us to be able to go through um, some of the changes that are going to be happening with your milestones this year. Um, and let's get my... Uh, my sharing. Let's, there it goes. Um, I have no disclosures. So the first thing I want to do is... Uh, huge shout out of thanks. Um, the One of the things that I think sometimes it's easy to forget is how much work it is to, to do the work of the milestones. Um, and that's uh, everything from the, the time commitment um, to the content to the knowledge that all of your peers will probably have something to say at some point about the work that you've actually created. Um, so I think that uh, these folks, they, they did a fantastic job um, and they worked really hard uh, to come up with the, the new milestones. Now, this first part is going to, for many of you, will be repetition, but I always like to cover it just in case there's some, some newer program directors um, on, on the phone um, this time, and, and really that's to make sure that everybody has the clear understanding of what milestones are. Um, and remember that we're talking about a significant point in development. Right, and being able to follow those points of development across the, the period of time that they're in your program. Um, being able to watch how it is that they can grow um, with whatever amount of time that they're with you. Um, and again, I know that this uh, slide looks very familiar to many of you, but again, I think it's important to always kind of re-review it um, to, to make sure that we're still using the milestones for the way that they're intended. When we think about milestones um, outside of, of course, your, your patients and the public, the work that we do really has four primary stakeholders. 
um, the ACGME. Uh, we use the milestones for research. We use it for continuous quality improvement. Um, the work that we've been doing in milestones has even been used by some of the specialties when they're rewriting their program requirements um, because it can give that kind of information. For training programs, um, the two things that I think it still does the, the best is number one, it helps you identify underperformers sooner. Um, so that way, if there is any work that needs to be done, um, you know about it in time to be able to offer remediation. Um, and the other piece that it does is that if you have somebody who is um, an advanced learner, somebody who is high and above uh, all of your, your other um, residents at that same level, you can identify them to make sure that you're giving them other opportunities um, that you might not be able to give to everybody because they're not at that level um, of, of skill or knowledge yet. For residents and fellows, uh, again, to highlight two things, one is that they become much better um, at, at doing a self-assessment if you have them do the milestones uh, twice a year uh, with with and comparing to the uh, CCC evaluation, um, find out how much insight they have uh, into, their, into their own knowledge and abilities. And that's gonna take them even further when they graduate from your program. Um, if they can't do a good self-assessment when they're with you, um, how are they going to be when they're doing it out um, when they're on their own? It also teaches them how to create learning plans. Um, and then these learning plans, of course, are really important, um, again, so when they're out on their own that they're able to, to keep a track of what it is that they're learning and how they're learning it. The last area is really high stakes decision making. And this is one that we talk about a lot. The milestones are not intended for high stakes decision making. Um, we don't want certification boards using the milestones for eligibility. We don't want state medical boards using them for licensing requirements. Um, they were not designed that way. The milestones are designed to be formative. Um, obviously at graduation, there is somewhat of a summative <laughs> purpose for them, but the overall design of these truly is to be formative. If you know of anybody who's using them in a high stakes fashion, please let us know. Um, it's, this is something that if we can, we try to intervene and have changes made. Um, and we have been successful in the past with that. But again, we have to know about it. So if, if you're aware, go ahead and send us an email. One of the things that we're doing also with the milestones is, is trying to make sure that there's a clear understanding of what the levels mean. And so we've tried to sort of break it out, uh, going, thinking more about um, the, the Dreyfus developmental wording that's used, and really especially thinking about the idea of clinical reasoning, because of course that is so critical um, for your, your residents' development. And so if you think about it this way, the, the level one is really that novice. This is that resident that you're saying, stand here, do this, hold this, don't touch that, right? You wanna make sure that they're very well controlled. That level two is an advanced beginner. Now, the advanced beginner, this is your person who is able to do some things on their own. Um, and, you know, obviously with clear supervision, um, but they've, they've started to demonstrate some skills. That level three is competence. Now, at competent, this is really where they're able to manage all of those common sort of situations, common presentations, um, common, common disease states, things that they're seeing a lot. The thing that starts happening at this level three is this is really where your residents are able to start doing what we call dual process thinking. And this is where they're able to make a decision quickly, right? They can see the image and they can say, I see a fracture in the pick a spot, um, whereas and now what they're able to do in the dual process thinking is they're able to go back later on, look at that image again, and not only be able to say what it was, but to really think through the entire process of what they're seeing and relate it to other diagnoses or other information that might be in their chart. Now, this is really exhausting for these residents because they're having to purposefully do this. When they get to level four, which is really where they're more proficient, this is really where they're able to do all of those things for common and complex or uncommon sort of, of things. Um, 
but now they're doing that dual process reasoning more naturally. It's something that they don't think about doing, it just, they just do. That level five is the one area where we've changed the definition a little bit. Um, previously, most of our specialties thought of that level five as somebody who's three to five years out into practice. Well, now the way we try to think about it is really that it's more of the expert resident. So thinking of that resident that is, you know, uh, way above all of their peers. Um, you might have uh, one every couple of years who actually gets to the level of expert. Um, this really is still meant to be something that is um, exceptional. Um, it, you shouldn't have the majority of your residents getting to a level five uh, on, on any of the milestones, um, but you should be able to get people to a level five if they are extraordinary residents. And sometimes they might be extraordinary in specific areas. You might have somebody who is excellent at all of the systems-based practice pieces, right? And so they're able to, to achieve those levels there. They might be able to achieve it in a couple of areas, but it's highly unlikely that you would have a resident who is able to get a level five on lots of different areas. I like this slide because it's really just to serve as a reminder when you're thinking about your milestones. Um, it's easy to take all the numbers out of your med hub or, or new evaluate, you know, or your evaluation or whichever system it is that you're using um, to make a decision on your milestones. But really what we're looking at is the narrative. We want to make sure that you're reading the milestones to make those decisions of where it is that, that your resident is landing at any, at any single time. Those numbers can help you start to focus in a particular level or, or, or two, um, but it really is all about the comments and what the wording actually says within the milestone. And finally, um, I always have to throw this out before we get to I say finally, before we get to Milestones 2.0, um, remember that the milestones are not intended to be an assessment tool. The milestones are intended to sort of be the receptacle of all of the other assessments that you're doing. Um, and remember, it's all about the conversation. I think a, you, can, you can find a much better uh, next step, if you will, for your resident after you've had those conversations. And having the same types of conversations for every resident, whether it's somebody who is struggling or somebody who is advancing a little quicker, um, use that opportunity to, 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 of the CCC meeting to make sure that you're doing that. And remember that not everything that should be evaluated is included in the milestones. And, and that is one area where you wanna make sure that you are actually assessing your residents for everything that they need to be assessed for. So on to the, the big part of the story today, the Milestones 2.0. Um, you know, one of the things that we did when Milestones first came out was we made a, a commitment um, that we were going to come back and look at the Milestones after three to five years and make edits and make changes. And so we did this a lot of different ways. Um, we did surveys, we did uh, talk to program directors. Um, I came to one of your meetings a few years ago. Um, we, we went to individual programs and talked with program directors, faculty and residents, um, really to learn. And there were a couple of, of big lessons that we learned. Um, in many cases, there were too many comp sub-competencies. There was, um, the language was too complex. Um, overall, it was just too much. Now, of course, in radiology, that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, we, <laughs> we actually had a little bit of a problem in radiology that there wasn't enough. Um, and it was one of the big things that, that came out loud and clear. And so what we did was when the group sat down to start working, um, they really tried to think about the milestones uh, in, in multiple ways. Um, Number one, I think, as they were thinking about it, was what was it that was going to make it the easiest for programs to actually assess, um, where they weren't having to think of things that were so disparate and try to come up with a single evaluation, um, which I think is one of the, the great things that the committee did. And not only was it gonna be helpful and easier for the CCC to make these decisions, 
but it was going to be easier for the resident to understand where they might be behind or where they might need to work a little harder um, because they weren't at the level that they thought um, without having to think, well, was I behind for A, B, C, or D? Um, it's much clearer, I think, in, in the new way that they've done it. Um, so what we committed to uh, with the, the new milestones was a couple of things. Um, number one, we worked really hard uh, to take out anything that sounded like edu speak. Um, we tried to make the language uh, simple. Um, when, the, when they were working on their milestones, everything had to be developmental across all levels. Um, so you couldn't have things that for example, only showed up in level three, right? So it became more of a checkbox uh, than it was a, a developmental milestone. And so this is, is showing you uh, just an image of really the same, uh, the same milestone, essentially, uh, for consultation. Um, the other big difference that, that we made um, was two things. One was we took out this idea of as defined by the program. Um, it, everything is, is as defined by the program. Um, and you know we didn't wanna make that so explicit in the milestones. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that when we get to the supplemental guide. Um, because the other thing we added in was uh, you now have two extra categories outside of the, the five levels and the in-betweens. That is not yet completed level one, um, which is essentially for somebody who is can't do level one. Um, you might think of it as a critical deficiency um, or you know somebody who really, this should send a big message to a resident who is marked as not yet completed level one because this is considered not a good thing. Um, the other one is not yet accessible. And the not yet accessible would be for somebody who has, maybe they haven't rotated in that area yet or they haven't had those didactics. Um, they haven't had enough uh, opportunity for assessment. These things are all really important to consider, and we wanted to make sure you were able to differentiate between those two when you were evaluating your residents. Another one that we changed was procedures. Um, and so this is one where you can see we've, we've basically made two rows, um, and we're talking about procedures overall. And it's really the level for which they can perform their procedures. But you can see as you look across, you have clear developmental um, transitions from the, that novice level all the way up to that expert level. And of course, I forgot to turn my phone on silent um, because I'm not in front of an audience to really think about it. Sorry about that. Um, uh, but we did. We worked really hard to make sure that these things were all going to be really clear um, for everybody going through. Um, the next piece that was different was this idea of the supplemental guide. Now, this is something that realistically we should have had uh, something similar the first time around, um, but we, I don't think we were quite that uh, far ahead at that point. So we created these supplemental guides as a way to assist the programs, uh, to give you a better idea of what it was that the, the, the development group was thinking as they were creating and writing um, each of these milestones. It's really a companion tool, um, and it's something that we hope that, that your programs are going to use. There are several areas uh, included in it. Um, there's the overall intent, um, which I think for most of the milestones, the title is pretty clear uh, what they meant for that milestone, um, but it's an opportunity to sort of express it a little bit differently. There are examples for each of the levels and each of the bullets, um, or I should say each of the rows within it. Um, as you can see, the milestones are right next to the examples, so it's something that's you know, easy for you to review. We give you ideas for assessment models or tools, um, things that, that might help you to better assess this particular one. Um, I'm gonna come back to curriculum mapping. And then notes and resources. These are things that the committee thought would either help uh, the program director or CCC better understand, or it could be something that you might use if you have a resident who's struggling, um, pointing to a particular website or pointing to a particular journal article. Something that, again, is gonna help continue in that development. That line for curriculum mapping is actually a line that was developed more for your use than for our group's use. Oh, look, sorry, let me go back to this one. Um, 
with the, the milestones and with the supplemental guide, what we've done is we've made this available as both a PDF and a Word document. Our hope is that you're going to take this document and sit down with your clinical competency committee and come up with your own examples. What is it that you expect of your residents at each of these levels in your program? Every program is different. You have a different set of patients. Uh, you have different resources. You have different opportunities. And so you should be able to, to sit down with your CCC make the, the assessment, the number part of your CCC evaluation a little bit easier by creating the shared mental model, filling in the assessment tools that you have, any notes or resources for your own program, fill all those things in. The other final thing you can do is put where in the curriculum you actually are intending to review this particular subcompetency. Now, Patient care, medical knowledge, those are probably going to be throughout the program, right? There's not going to be a lot of places uh, where you, you probably wouldn't be evaluating it. But you may, you may want to think about professionalism. Um, let, let's say the first one, we were talking about ethics. Um, that might be something that you want to pick specific rotations to actually evaluate that. Or the one that's on communicating with patients and families. Um, you probably have some, some rotations where they're very purposefully interacting with patients, and there's going to be other rotations where they may not be. And so you want to take that opportunity to enter those things into it. Hey, Laura. Yes. We're, we're, a, couple, we're a minute over right now. Oh. Are you pretty close to finalizing your content? I am. I am. I'm so sorry. So very quickly at the back of the supplemental guide is the mapping between level between version one and version two. Um, create that 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 shared mental model. And hopefully you guys are going to get my slides. Um, and there's a lot of information um, available on the website that I hope that you will go back and, and use. So I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, thank you very much, Laura, and uh, all the speakers, um, Janet and Felicia. Um, Stephanie, do we have time to continue to uh, do some online answers of questions now? Yes, we do. Okay, awesome. Um, the first question I have here, I think, is best directed toward Felicia. Um, it's a question about the uh, survey. It says, since the survey is optional, if the results of the survey are suboptional, will it still result in a citation? Um, the short answer is, I don't know. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, there are a significant number of programs that have not reached the 70% compliance, um, and it has affected programs in two survey windows. So what that, that really um, detracts from our national uh, compliance rate that we would normally publish, which is usually our sort of standard and measure uh, for assessing what appears to be out of compliance. Um, it will also affect the specialty uh, national compliance rate. So at this time, I'm not really sure what sort of uh, data we will be given to be able to assess that. Um, if if uh, we don't have enough survey participants, for example, the data that I looked at, there are some programs that have zero um, compliance. There are some programs that have 10%, 20%. So we'll need enough uh, survey responses to help us understand where the, where that is. Uh, bottom line, I don't know. Thank you, Felicia. I think that's a um, an example of the type time of uh, life that we're in right now with the pandemic. Thank you. Um, I have a question now. I think best for Janet. Uh, may multiple residents get credit for interpreting the same already finalized mammogram? Yeah, I would say yes to that. This is not the uh, practice pattern or work pattern we want in our residency programs normally, but during COVID and for people that need to graduate, I think it's completely reasonable because it's still blinded. They're not gonna work together. I would say they should be independently interpreting those already finalized mammograms and they should be staffed uh, basically separately. But yeah, there's no reason the same training material can't be used by more than one resident. Thank you. Uh, the next question I think is for you too. Uh, to clarify, adding a clinical year would essentially make a program categorical rather than advanced, correct? 
to my under as far as I understand, that's correct. Felicia, you agree with that? Okay. Thank you. Um, getting back to the case logs, I think this uh, question refers to um, kind of the difference between the IR case log and the DR case log. It's will it be possible to do aggregate logs too? My understanding is that aggregate will pertain to the imaging study case logs, but individual to the procedural case log. Is that correct? That's the model we're trying to develop is a hybrid model. So the aggregate reporting will remain and the special reporting for interventional cases will be new, but similar to what surgery is doing. And this is not just, we're not making this up. We're doing this in conjunction with the SIR people and interventional radiologists who formed a task force and developed um, kind of the information that they think is important. So uh, I don't know, hopefully that clarifies that. We're not trying to create something out of a vacuum. We're trying to do something that makes sense to the community of IR. I have a follow-up question there. Um, regarding the AC ACGME case log project, SIR just piloted a new training tracker that will allow, allow IR trainees to manually enter their procedures into a spreadsheet and then categories logs categorize logs into ACGME case log categories. Is the ACGME project trying to accomplish the same thing? So basically what we're trying to do is take that uh, work that was done and put that into the ACGME world and it hopefully will also be transformed into an app that residents can use on their phone. And most people really love their phones very much. We can't live without our phones. So I think that's gonna be very popular. It would be for me. Yeah, I think the, um, S the SIR effort has really informed the direction that ACGME is taking and the ultimate goal of everybody is for our trainees to only have to maintain one log, not two, because that's uh, a real burden. So uh, we appreciate ACGME's uh, attention to the concerns of the IR trainees. Um, let's see. Here's one question. What is the process for taking ownership of our clinical year? That one, I'm gonna ask Felicia to clarify because if there is a process, she's gonna know better than me, I think. Um, it's in my head. It's coming, it's coming. Um, well, <laughs> we actually stipulate, uh, you'll see once the program requirements are posted and uh, the revisions are referred to by Dr. Bailey should be posted by the end of May for public review and comment so you can see all of the specifications you will see a statement within the requirements that says that you will actually have to apply uh, for that because the review committee would like to monitor uh, not only the programs that plan to do it, but to monitor the outline um, of how you plan to incorporate uh, that into your curriculum. So there will be some slight notification or application process. We just haven't fleshed it out yet. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Here's another question. Some of these questions I'm not smart enough to understand. Um, here's one about the milestones, Laura. Milestones for the IR program are slightly different from DR. Is there a plan for aligning these in the future? It will make it slightly easier to implement. Um, so there's actually, they're mostly the same, at least for the, the DR um, components. Uh, the, the few changes that they made, um, and I, off the top of my head, um, really were more for the things that delved into, like, for example, the procedures, um, because obviously for IR, they're going to have uh, uh, other types of procedures. They, for the most part, and I think for all but maybe one or two individual milestones, um, they essentially copied what DR did, uh, and that would be for the, the uh, integrated programs, or am I saying that right, Felicia, integrated? I always get them backwards. Um, for the integrated programs, as DR did their work, the IR group copied um, their work for those and then separated out, uh, again, for the independent programs. I have a follow-up question related to milestones. Um, would it be appropriate to use not yet completed level one for a first year in the first six month milestone? Um, I would say that that is the not yet completed level one would be if you had expected that resident to complete level one, um, 
then yes, I would use it. If it's that they didn't have enough opportunity, um, then I would use the not yet accessible. Thank you. Um, I have two questions here, Janet, related to uh, the requirements for I-131. Uh, one of them is, could I-131 be reconsidered to not be live case to count? <laughs> um, I don't think so, unfortunately. Liz Oates is our nuclear medicine specialist on the RRC, and she's also in the American Board of Radiology, so she was uniquely qualified to give us guidance on this and we do not believe that that's going to be possible. And I, I think that part of that is that we have no control over the NRC, right? Right, and it actually takes like an act of Congress to get anything done on mammography and on nuclear medicine and it's nobody's no, going to... Congress is busy that. doing other things. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right, this is a very... Um, this may not be something we can answer in this big group. It's a very specific circumstance related to the nuclear medicine requirements. And it also may be a question that is better directed to the ABR. I have a resident who will not complete the iodine therapy requirement who is moving to Canada for a neuroradiology fellowship. He may not be able to get that even during his fellowship. Will that affect him taking the certifying exam? That's definitely an ABR question. Um, with regards to graduation requirements and all of that, that uh, person, if that's a program director, should contact us to look at that individually. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, this is more philosophical. Um, there's a person who's asked us a question. Um, wait a minute, now I can't find it. Basically uh, saying, how are we going to predict whether or not a resident's going to be able to pass the boards if they come into residency we don't know how they how they did in medical school basically <laughs> they're all pass fail the usmle step one i mean the um step one is going to be pass fail what are we supposed to do and i don't think this is really a question that we can answer uh, as the acgme but i think it's a huge big issue for program directors and the residency selection process um, in the next uh, couple of years. And I do think it's an area where the APDR is going to have to help program directors figure out how to um, manage all the information or lack thereof. I'm happy for any of you to answer this, but I don't think this I is... I can share a little bit as, you know, been on the residency selection committee forever at our institution. <laughs> I think the first knee-jerk reaction most people had to this was, well, we'll just have to look at step two. We'll just have to require that step two be done and we'll look at step two so we have something objective. Um, so I think, I suspect that's a very common reaction to this. Um, and then the medical schools are gonna be dealing with board frenzy at a different part of medical school. <laughs> um, it's a hard problem. Yeah, no, it's a very hard problem, I agree. Um, I think that's all the questions that I have uh, here, and I, um, even though we've gone over, we've uh, kept most of our audience. I want to thank uh, Felicia, Janet, and Laura again for these talks and information. It's a huge amount of information. This session has been recorded, um, so it will be available for review for those of us who couldn't absorb it all on the first go round and for people who are unable to attend. I also wanna thank the uh, AUR staff for their ability to put this together. So thank you all very much and please stay safe and stay healthy.